most of you are pretty familiar with Mark's ideas. He is a, quite a polymath. Uh, he's written okay. on a whole lot of different areas, several articles and features in Extra View magazine. He even appears um, in a kind of a retro photo on the cover of issue number 10, which is outside. Um, we had an interview with Mark um, back then. You may want to pick up that issue. Uh, two part interview, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, so the two issues. Um, and apart from that, I think we'll let Mark introduce himself if he feels like he needs to say what his expertise is. But basically, he's an expert in just about anything he wants to be. <laughs> <laughs> That's why he's speaking on something really the, the confluence of two topics um, uh, an interesting perspective on computer security as the future of law. So I think we'll get an interesting perspective. The lawyers and legal theorists may be upset that uh, computer scientists are muscling into that arena. Uh, I'm sure will be very productive with muscling in. <laughs> As Eric mentioned last night, uh, the one bad thing about the term singularity is it causes lack of thought about, about the future past singularity. Uh, we're always going to be living under some kind of legal system, uh, something that serves the function in coordinating the activities of, of, our, of you know, our, our activities with each other, um, something that serves the function of a legal system. And the legal system we end up living under will see an outgrowth of aspects of the current world. Now, the conventional view of what aspect of the current world one should almost exclusively think of, think about, to try to understand how it will turn into the future legal system is the current legal system. Uh, what I'm proposing in this talk is that there are two important aspects of the current world, both of which can be seen as building legal systems of some sort, and both of which are going to be of major influence in, in determining what legal system we end up living under post-singularity. Um, the other aspect is computer security technology, and as both of these move forward, they'll be moving forward, they're not only going to be moving forward towards what comes to be future law, but the zigzag on this diagram is to say that they'll also be influencing and constraining each other. Um, so there'll be a lot, of, a lot of interfering effects in that motion. The structure of the talk is I'm first going to try to speak abstractly about what law is. Then um, I'm going to talk about how computer technology, in particular computer security technology, can, to a large extent, come to provide for us those services that we currently expect law to provide for us, that in that sense it will come to replace much of law. We will be turning to computer-based systems for what we now think to draft laws for. Um, how for other aspects of current law, uh, computer technology will enable us to evade them, it will make many aspects of current law unenforceable. And for yet other aspects of current law, um, computer technology will simply make it irrelevant. What is law? Well, law and rules are properly identified. Um, and to understand rules, think about the rules of a game. Um, imagine uh, Fisher and Spassky, let's say, playing chess with each other. Well, there are four different games being played simultaneously. On the one hand, they're playing chess with each other, um, you know, uh, where pawn to king four is a move in that game. Um, however, the, there are also creatures in civilization being paid prize money for playing, playing chess and coming to have chosen to play chess rather than do something else. Um, and there are also biological creatures emergent from biological evolution, and they're embedded in physics. No matter what they do with the pieces, um, not only can, can, by the rules of chess, Fisher not move pawn to king five as his opening move, but he also can't make the move in a way that violates conservation of momentum. Um, however, the important thing to understand about these, these levels of game is the astonishing degree of insulation they have from each other that if you want to understand the chess game, you can successfully ignore the other three levels. 
and still understand the chess game as a framework of rules in which diverse interests interact with each other and by the interaction of diverse interests within that framework produce emergent effects. So one of the most important concepts from computer science that we can bring to understand this layering is the notion of a virtual machine. Um, on the Macintosh, the Macintosh and the PC are two different instruction sets and operating systems and each of those is a universe with a laws of physics, if you will, for the creatures, the software programs that exist within those operating systems. Now, one of the things that you can do, this is in fact what Turing universality is about, is that uh, there's this program that runs on the Macintosh called Soft PC. What that program is, is that program itself runs within the universe described by the Macintosh laws of physics. It has to play by the Macintosh rules. However, what that program does is it instantiates the PC rules. It, it creates a, a universe within those rules such that within that universe, PC programs can run and see the rules of the PC. So um, another important issue, so, so once you want, we understand that we can build virtual machines on top of each other and that they can be insulated, um, an important thing to realize is that you also get multi-level evolution. That uh, within chess, the ideas about good chess moves evolve, but also the fact that they are playing chess rather than some other game is due to, at a level below, the separate evolution of different games competing with each other, the mostly separate evolution. So, what does this have to do with what we normally call law? Law, legal systems, are, the emergent, are something that emerged through evolutionary competition in the world. They're an emergent result. And what is it, and in retrospect, we can see legal systems as having evolved to do, to do, I'm going to say three things. I'm sure that there are, there are, more, there are more things that one can list that are probably equally important with these three. But, um, with that, before legal systems, we simply had the rules of biology. We're playing with each other in the rules of biology, uh, red in tooth and claw, where force and terror are the rules of the game that we have to interact with each other. Um, by layering legal systems on top of this, the legal systems create a virtual machine embedded in the rules of biology, such that within the virtual machine produced by the legal system, we have a different framework of evolution, such as markets, um, such that within that framework of evolution, um, different emergent properties like civilization can emerge. Um, so, legal so the legal systems can be seen, especially uh, as of this century, as having competed. One, with respect to what the rules are, I shouldn't play chess or checkers, should we play capitalism or communism or socialism? Um, they're competing with each other with respect to how well, ins how much insulation they are in fact providing us from the underlying rules of biology. Uh, how well protected are we from aggression by other nations and how well protected are we from aggression by criminals? And they are They are providing us insulation from the mechanisms, they're competing to provide us insulation from the mechanisms of their own internal evolution. The old problem of who will watch the watchers. The, the institution which produces the laws that enables these games like markets to be possible are themselves corruptible by virtue of interaction with the incentives produced by the market. So uh, they compete with each other to create mechanisms like the founding fathers' separation of powers, like the accountability of democracy, to try to put some kind of break on that potential for corruption. With all three of these, we can see the result of what they're reaching for as a neutral framework of rules supporting cooperation without vulnerability. Um, I would say this is a, actually a good restatement of a classical liberal ideal. Um, the new, I would even add neutral simple framework of rules for st restating the classical liberal ideal. Uh, neutral means they don't make special cases for particular parties. Um, and 
It's a framework of rules, as in rules of the game, which can be understood. Um, and the, vulner the lack of vulnerability is the insulation from biology. And what we're trying to achieve is a system in which, without vulnerability, we can engage in large-scale cooperation and give rise to things like, like civilization. Ah, turn the slide before I almost made the crucial point, which is this statement is also an extremely good statement of what computer security technology is. A good secure operating system is also a neutral framework of rules, neutral simple framework of rules that can be understood. It's neutral because it does not make special cases for particular programs that run under the operating system. It provides lack of vulnerability of the programs to each other in that it provides separate address spaces so the programs cannot reach into each other's address space and, and uh, stomp on their beds. Viruses. Uh, a good secure operating system is one, in which, one which is naturally immune from viruses. And um, uh, anybody who thinks uh, this is beyond what we know how to do with computers um, is, uh, has been, um, there's a, yes, they're wrong, thank you. Uh, Norm, could you please stand up? Okay. Um, uh, any, anybody who, who wishes to dispute, with, uh, dispute that fact, I would refer them first to Norm and, and myself as well. Um, in any case, um, a, good a good secure operating system, in fact, provides a framework in which programs can succeed at cooperating with each other within the rules without being vulnerable to each other. And this is not only possible, it's been done. It's been done in commercial products that have shipped. Um, it's just not part of the computer infrastructure that we're used to this generation. The first notion I would talk about is smart contracts. Contracts which are embodied in running programs, embodied in software in such a way that the contract is self-enforcing by virtue of the, of the way in which the program operates when it runs. Um, I'm then going to talk about um, what what we're building in electric communities and the idea of the kind, the kind of thing we're building in electric communities, a distributed, secure, social, virtual reality. Uh, talk about that in terms of a um, layered cake of a distributed architecture uh, for providing accessible security um, for, uh, in the context of supporting social interactions among people. Um, virtual voluntary communities is the next step past just providing a new framework of law, it's also providing new frameworks within such a system for the evolution of legal systems. And uh, then smart property is, um, takes a lot of these ideas and says, not only do they apply within the computer system, but by embedding such computer systems within physical objects, a lot of our contractual arrangements regarding physical objects can come to be embodied in the behavior of the objects themselves. So, with smart contracts, um, probably, as far as I know, the first public smart contracting system was the American Information Exchange, both Bill Salen's Amex system. Um, in the Amex system, uh, in its support for mini consulting, it was this online multi-user system in which uh, people who needed something done and people who had services to offer could find each other. There's all sorts of things for facilitating finding each other, and then they could contract with each other. I'll be talking about the contracting mechanism. In the contracting mechanism, the, the con a contract was a partially machine understood uh, entity. Part of the contract, so a contract would be something like, uh, um, you agree to write a document for me explaining blah, blah, blah. And on delivery of the document, I agree to pay you 15 bucks. Um, so the fact that on delivery of the document, you pay, I pay you 15 bucks, that was the part of the, that was machine understandable. The content of the document <coughs> I was expecting was simply expressed in English text, but the two were, were, were irrevocably attached to each other. And certain steps in the negotiation process, one where, where you can make binding commitments, and the bindingness of those commitments were understood by the system. If then you deliver me a document, I have a choice of either 
paying you, or making a claim that the document that you are handing me does not satisfy the terms of the contract expressed in English, in which case it gets bumped from the machine enforcement to a human enforcement system where we have a dispute about whether the text that describes what I was asking for in the text you provided me disagreed. This is a wonderful example of a system that straddles computer technology and human legal system. The contract was executing within the computer system to the extent that that was the right thing to do, and then when it hit a judgment case that can't be solved just within the system, it was bumped to a dispute resolution process. However, it was not possible within that system to simply not pay and not claim and not make a specific claim that there was a lack of fulfillment of the contract. You could only not pay by making such a claim. So this is the difference between this and contracting in the world is very striking. In contracting right now in the normal world, there's this astonishing thing where I can make a contract with you and I can violate it. Fisher cannot open the chess game with pawn to king pawn. I mean, it just sort of just can't do it in some sense. But I can violate the contract and still be in the game in some sense. With contracts that enforce by execution, suddenly that comes to not be an option. I want to recommend the only URL I'm presenting in this talk is Nick Szabo's URL. Nick, could you please stand up? Nick is an extraordinarily insightful and innovative thinker about matters of smart contracting and other such matters. And I strongly recommend his website and the papers there. I find a continual stream of new insights as he continues to produce. OK. Now, here's where I get blatantly commercial. However, as many of you who know me know, my passions don't derive from my commercial affiliation. Instead, my commercial affiliations derive from my passion. So what we're doing at Electric Communities is we're building a social virtual reality system. So let me explain what that is. The first decent description of a social virtual reality was True Names by Werner Vinge. That, in turn, inspired the first implemented social virtual reality of the Lucasfilm Habitat system by Chip Morningstar and Randy Farber. In these systems, you have on the screen, like in a video game, a fantasy role-playing character. So imagine, let's say, you're playing Nintendo. You have Super Mario on the screen. Super Mario is your presence within the virtual world of the game that you're playing, within the virtual world of that universe. We call that your avatar. And as in Mario, you can move around from place to place in that universe. Unlike Mario, the universe is a multi-person universe in which if you move into a place in the world with your avatar that I'm already in with my avatar, I see your avatar, you see my avatar, we're both seeing both on the screen, and now we can talk to each other, we can have conversations, we can exchange objects, we can engage in all sorts of interactions. In Habitat, the result of creating this new world for social interactions was not just the emergence of a lot of chat. It was actually the emergence of a sense of a society and the beginning of a sense of a history and a culture. Habitat then went on to Chip and Randy did it again with Habitat Japan, Fujitsu Habitat in Japan, and then with Worlds Away and CompuServe right now. What we're doing in Electric Communities is Chip and Randy's fourth attempt, well, fourth system. What we're doing this time, though, is much grander than the previous three. In the previous three, there was always an institution which was providing reality, which was serving reality, and the users would come 
to the reality server in order to interact with each other. In this system, what we're doing is we're creating a set of um, open standards and protocols, um, and software will be selling, of course, uh, such that anyone can create a particular reality, a piece of reality, and, and go online serving a piece of reality from their place. It's as decentralized as the web. The wonder of the web is not only can anybody go and read, but anyone can just go and create a new website. And then as you follow the link, you smoothly move from one website to the other. And the system we're building now, we're building it so that virtual reality as a whole is a patchwork of separate virtual realities served by separate institutions uh, and then you with your avatar can smoothly move from one to the other. Um, okay. Now, not only is this a, a distributed virtual um, reality for social interaction, it's also a distributed secure system in which many of the kinds of interaction we have with each other are actually provided with, with strong, you know, are actually built out of strong computer security technology. So um, the computer security model we're using is distributed capabilities. I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, going up from there, what we have is we've making the power of the secure, secure computing technology accessible to people by the, using the user interface metaphor of possession of a physical object as the holding of a bundle of rights. So I seem to have something in my pocket. What this thing in my pocket is, is it simply reifies into an apparently physical object something that actually represents a bundle of rights. And then when I walk up to you and I hand it to you, <laughs> then what I've done is I've given you those rights. So the fact that we have these simple physical intuitions about handling of physical objects and physical possession of physical objects makes the, a lot of the otherwise hard to, to understand by, by, by non-programmers, and frankly hard to understand by programmers sometimes, power of computer security technology makes that accessible. Um, so, so that's the user interface level. We're building that out of distributed capabilities. And the distributed capabilities themselves are implemented through a distributed cryptographic protocol that, that um, for providing the, um, the guarantees of that security model. So there's been, there's a very large, back, back in the 70s, computer science uh, created much wonderful power. There's lots and lots of great power that was created, especially in like the time-sharing days of the 70s. Uh, but the problem is that through the user interface at the time, command line interfaces, um, it was very hard for many people to get it. I mean, it was it was very syntax heavy and it was it was um, not not well intuitive for for most people. Then along came things like Macintosh, with the slogan you know computation for the rest of the world. And it took that, it did not create new powers, it did not make computers able to do things that they hadn't been able to do before. What it did is it took the powers that were already understood and it made them accessible. Um, the way I like to think of this is as cryptography for the rest of us. The computer science of today, one of its most important areas of innovation is uh, cryptographic protocols as coordinating mechanisms among diverse interests, providing all sorts of hard guarantees. How do we bring out that power to people in such a way that people can use it intuitively without having to think about it very much? Well, the layered cake here is that when I take my when I take my wallet and I hand it to Max, at the top layer I've handed my wallet to Max. What's going on underneath is a bunch of cryptographic protocol stuff has happened such that an actual commercial transaction has with, um, with, with all of the properties that we associate with that is able to happen at a lower layer as a result of that simple exchange at the user interface layer. Let's say you wanted something in exchange. Oh. <laughs> the differences between 
computer security paradigms parallel to a significant extent, to a surprising extent, uh, differences between political philosophies. The main computer security paradigm we have in the world right now, represented by what everybody takes somehow to be the representative of a secure system, which is Unix. They probably take it to be the representative because they're actually stuck with Macs and PCs. Um, <laughs> But Unix is essentially the generic form of a security paradigm called access control lists. And access control lists are, and you know, Unix derives historically from Multix, which was the canonical access control list system. Um, the access control lists embody the idea that what rights you have depends on what kind of person you are. <coughs> That it depends, first of all, on who you are, that, that, identity, that rights are given to identities, and then rights are given to groups. So what your group is, like what status you have, determines what rights you have. So this is like under feudalism, where for, for many of the rights that you have, the rights were associated with whether you, you know, were a serf or a lord or whatever. And when your rights changed, they changed in a large bundle through a major ritual of emancipation. Um, ring security, uh, which is also, by the way, embodied in Multics, um, is um, uh, no longer a dominant paradigm in the world, but it's a dominant paradigm in thinking, in various thinking about security in academia. And it sees the core security problem as how to protect the system from the users. <laughs> Um, capabilities, the basic, the capabilities are a, well, probably the single most important thing about capabilities, it took me a long time of thinking about capabilities to come to this way of thinking about it, is that the others are security models, which, you know, which, which are neutral on what, what, what computation is. Capabilities is not just a security model, it's a computation model. It's a model of computation. Uh, it's represented most purely by the actor paradigm at MIT, which I won't go into today. Um, but uh, the basic thing about capabilities is rights are fine-grained and they're individually transferable. And if you think back about how we made it from feudalism to capitalism, a major aspect there was the emergence of what we now what we would now call modern notions of contracting, modern notions of commercial law which were the ability to reify packages of rights that were things other than physical possession of physical objects, and to transfer them individually by contract. And the result was that um, you could come to acquire rights in a piecemeal and fine-grained fine fashion, and there was much more flexibility in the system. There were many more degrees of freedom in the kind of cooperation. That, that that change of rules enabled. Evolution of legal systems within social virtual realities, what I call voluntary virtual communities. And what, so I mentioned that there are different institutions serving different places in reality. These different institutions, one of the things that they can compete with each other on is what are the rules that apply to you when you are within my part of reality? So, so as people create these different parts of these different parts of reality, they can come up with their own notion of what are good rules for a social system, and create parts of realities embodying those rules, and then those then that can be part of how these parts of reality compete with each other. So there's going to be two scenarios that I'm talking about. Um, one is crudes are us, and the other one is chopping people's heads off. Um, because this is a, decent, a completely decentralized system, um, you have to start with saying, in the absence of having contracted away rights, what rights do I start with? And, and so the, the, the basal set is, um, you know, you have complete rights to yourself and your stuff, and and um, you know, and a lack of ability to destructively interfere with each other, very much like in a secure operating system, and. So in the absence of, a, of other arrangements, a part of reality has no means to enforce other rules. 
in order to enforce other rules, a part of reality has to have some lever that enables it to, to create rules other than the base rules, and that lever is terms of entry, that something has to be agreed on in order to go into that part of reality. So Cruz R Us is about creating, um, uh, for example, because this is a game and many children will be playing it, um, uh, this, I mean, this, among other things, a gaming world, but game, games for children are certainly part of the target here. There will certainly be parents that want the assurance that a particular part of reality is child safe. So, a particular vendor of a part of reality can have as a term of entry that any <coughs> avatar costume, any of the clothing that an avatar comes in with, i.e. in order to, the, the, the things that can be entered into the rendering tree so they can be rendered on the screen, <laughs> must not contain naughty bits. Um, and the way they, and naughty bits is, is, is very much a judgmental thing, just like the, um, the, with the, with Amex, the interact, Amex providing for the interaction of human judgment through the dispute resolution process with the computer mediated contracting. Over here, the human judgment is uh, some labeling organization like Cruz R Us, labeling uh, various images as containing no naughty bits or no, or no naughty pixels. Um, and then the, um, the various um, organizations that want to run child safe parts of reality insisting on those certificates on the images in order to enter with that costume on your avatar. More interesting example is chopping people's heads off. Um, once again, because it's a gaming world, or it's, it's, I'm sorry, it's among other things a gaming world, um, the reason I keep making that mistake is that the earlier habitats were more specifically gaming worlds. Um, there might be parts of reality that want to have rules such as, over here, when you enter my castle, sword fighting is fine. And if in this castle somebody strikes a fatal blow to your head with their sword, you lose your head. And they get to keep it. <laughs> and that they might further say, it's not just the image of your head, it's your actual head as a scarce object that you've lost, such that you then have to go, such that when you leave here, you are in fact without your head and you have to go to what uh, we call, what was actually in, uh, in Habitat, called the head shop. <laughs> in order to find a new head. Um, uh, so, once again, there's this issue of, if the base rules are such that, well, hey, I own my head, nobody can take my head from me, how is it that once I'm in the castle, the castle can take, you know, the, the, the rules of the castle can decide that I've lost my head, and I am prevented from saying, no, I didn't lose my head, it's still mine, and, and how do I keep the castle from taking it? And the way I do that is, on entry to the castle, I have to actually, the castle has a term of entry where I actually have to give it ownership of my head. And then the castle takes my head and lends it back to me. So the head is still on the neck of my avatar, but it's no longer owned by me. I'm simply, I'm simply borrowing it with it having the right to evict me from ownership of my head. And then what it, so, so what it is doing is on entry, it is acquiring from the entrance enough rights that it now has the means to enforce whatever framework of rules it is trying to embody. And it's the design, it's, it's the design effort of the creators of that part of reality to figure out what that is and to embody the rules well. As far as the base rules are concerned, the castle on my, owns my head now, it, can, it, can, it, it does not need to return it. I have an understanding that it's going to return it when I leave, but that's a reputation issue now on the part of the castle. And if it keeps heads other than what looks like via a fair blow to the head with the sword by the players, then that castle will come to have a reputation as, as, as being a little bit um, unfair in, in deciding that. That Zabo guy again. Um, has come up with 
the, 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 uh, the notion and the coinage of smart property. Um, a wonderful example is the, auto, the automatically repossessed automobile, or the auto repo auto. Um, it's, it's one where the arrangement that you have with the bank is embodied in the behavior of the automobile, and if the automobile, the, for example, um, if you if it's not getting from you know the appropriate receipts, uh, you know cryptographic receipts about money money transferred to the bank from 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 you to, to the bank on behalf of the loan payment or whatever, uh, the automobile can can decide on whatever. For what, on whatever criteria is according in accord with the contract that it embodies, that it has been repossessed. And once it decides that, it can decide that it, it no longer wishes to be operated, to be operated by you. And uh, Nick's done some, uh, you know, I refer you to the next page about the details of this. But the slogan I want to introduce, it's always good to introduce a slogan. Um, the slogan I want to introduce is that we're moving from a world in which possession is nine-tenths of the law into one in which behavior is nine-tenths of the law. Um, what the, the, the slogan possession is nine-tenths of the law has been widely misunderstood. Let me explain, what it, let me explain briefly what it means. Um, when there is a dispute, it is frequently the case, and I've lived through an, a, a very vivid example of this, that who it is that actually is in physical possession of the object about with which the dispute is, that fact of physical possession has extraordinary influence in the actual outcome of the dispute, even if abstractly the law would have it otherwise. Um, so in this case, so you know, I might think I own it, and I might think I might win a court case, but I have to take you to court. And besides that, it's, and, and at the moment it's in your house. So if it's in your house, my I have much more overhead in trying to get the dispute resolved than you do. Um, in the case of the repossessed of, of the auto repo auto, the behavior is the 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 basic condition that needs to be overcome by resort to other means if there's a dispute. But cryptography and computer networks and the means for electronic commerce. Uh, should provide us with the ability to engage in transactions which don't happen any particular place. And if the transaction didn't happen in a particular place, it's going to be very hard to claim what jurisdiction um, governs it. Um, strong anonymity and cryptographic shielding should make, it, make many transactions invisible anyway. Many of our intuitions about law, many of the services we're getting from law, computers will make those, some of those impossible, and some of that's actually the very bad news. But nevertheless, it is news. Um, and um, knowledge once public will be much more irrevocably public than it ever has been. And limitations that people try to place on the use of public knowledge Will, be, will come to be the least enforceable of current laws. Copyright is over. Once you've shown somebody bits, they've got the bits. They can copy them. Um, there's a lot of things that you hear about right now, um, including by, by some friends of mine, that are claiming to be solving this problem. If this problem is easily shown and not to be solvable. Um, and, you can, and the resort to current law enforcement to punish violators only works if you can figure out who the violator is. If you can engage in and profit by the copyright violation without anybody being able to track you down to an actual person or, or a physical location. Privacy. <coughs> we hear two things. Computers will make us, give us more privacy and computers will give us less privacy. Computers will give us more privacy than we've ever had before because of cryptography. Um, uh, suddenly, for the first time, individuals will be able to, to um, resist, successfully resist major snooping efforts by large national governments. That's extraordinary. That's a, that's a huge, huge change in the world. On the other hand, um, computers will give us less privacy. Many of the places where we're currently used to having privacy, um, the ease of access of public knowledge and the ease of correlation 
will remove a lot of what we currently think of as privacy. Um, uh, an example is that you go and interview a job somewhere, so your employer, unbeknownst to you, simply does a deja news search to scan all the net news postings you've ever written. Um, and he goes and skins those, and many of those net news postings are something that you thought of as not something that would ever intersect with your work life. And now suddenly it's information available to a prospective employer. So will computers give us more privacy or less privacy? Um, both. Com what, what computers will do is it will turn off the contrast knob. It will remove the gray. Uh, information that you successfully keep private, you can have more private than you've ever had before, but once it's no longer private, it's fully enough, it's fully public. Ignoring that, from the founding of this country through to today, our most important legal right has been free speech. The reason it's been the most important is it's the one that enables us to argue for all of the rest of them. And it has had to be a legal right because in the absence of having this, this delicate permission from our government, um, total, you, you can get all sorts of runaway totalitarian effects that have been experienced by other countries this century. However, with the emergence of the internet, this has suddenly made a transition from no longer being something from which we desperately need this, this, this permission from our governments. We simply have it. We have free speech now. And to a first approximation, unless things turn very, very sour, nobody can take it away from us. Um, and I expect more that, that computers, as they develop, and embed themselves more fully in our society will take more of the things that we currently depend on the legal system for, depend on having this delicate permission from governments for, and they'll simply turn them into technological facts for which we don't have to beg permission. Um, now, technological facts, that seems very neutral, right? I mean, why should, if, if, if the, the, the facts that technology can provide in this matter, well, they might be good or they might be bad. The reason why I think that, in general, we should expect the facts produced by large-scale networking to be good is by direct analogy with uh, John Stuart Mill's argument for free speech. Um, the only thing I can do with, with, to you with a network is send you bits. I cannot engage in violence through a network. If I send you a virus, under current law, I have attacked you and I'm legally liable. I think that's a mistake. But I, the virus is still just bits, and your vulnerability to the virus is purely a result of how you react to those bits. And the, and, uh, the to, well, I'm, I'm going to shorten this, but uh, to make the appropriate analogy with John Stuart Mill, it's through the interaction and education of this freedom to transmit bits that the entities receiving those bits come to not be so delicately vulnerable to bad bits, bad speech. We're making much of current law unenforceable. Um, and a mean that we should spread is that you shouldn't, you shouldn't have laws on the books which are unenforceable. Having, once you've made laws unenforceable, having them still on the books is, is it creates, in fact, a terrible danger. We are creating a terrible danger by making many of our current laws unenforceable because unenforceable laws on the books are a temptation to corruption. Never legislate that you can innovate. Never solve with the law what can be solved with technology. A good example of this is cell phone privacy. There's a problem right now, which is that um, cell phones are, your, your voice is transmitted in the clear. Anybody can eavesdrop. So what they did was they passed a law. You're no longer allowed to eavesdrop. Great, the problem solved. Now nobody eavesdrops on cell phones. My conversations are private. I have a long time. <laughs> if instead we had not had that law, then the demand for cryptographic protections would have happened sooner. The cryptographic protection would happen sooner. And with cryptography, the statement I just made would not be stupid. <laughs> Why am I giving this whole talk in which I seem to have it in for law? Well, I don't have it in for law. I like law. We need law. We need good law. Um, we need law in the vision, in the old classical liberal vision, the vision of the founding fathers, 
a neutral, simple framework of rules supporting cooperation without vulnerability. What we have instead is what they most fear. One of their slogans was a government of laws and not of men. We no longer have that. We now have a government of men. We have large, non-neutral, complex law with many special cases and with very little insulation from corruption by the lawgivers. To the degree to which we can take law and embody it in computation, we have the almost perfect realization of the phrase, a government of laws and not of men. So law is being squeezed by how computers absorb much of the function of current law, how computers will make much of current law unenforceable or too difficult to enforce, too expensive to enforce, how computers will make much of current law irrelevant, but there is still a remaining part of current law, which is the basic, most fundamental part of current law, which is going back to insulating us from the rules of biology, insulating us from the rules of force and terror, the laws against you know, murder and rape and theft, et cetera, um, laws against physical aggression, physical violence. Which you, which you cannot do through computer networks, but we're not limited to interacting with each other only through computer networks. There remains the physical world. Um, and as far as this talk is concerned, um, those laws need to stay on the books. We still need human enforced legal systems to provide that part of law, that this argument about computers can only absorb the rest of it. However, um, Thinking farther ahead, thinking post-singularity, even that part isn't necessarily um, systems of talking something to be enforced by systems of talking primates. It must be enforced by something that has a physical presence in the world. But high-tech robotics combined with computer technology, um, i.e., active shields, as talked about engines of creation, uh, can, potentially can move into that territory. But that is a topic for a different medium such as you saw last night. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, Andrea Gallagher. Um, I was thinking about smart contracts, and I'm kind of curious how you see as um, computer security starts competing with current law um, how do you start, does computer security start replacing current law when current law is satisfactory where computer security is strong? So how do you get over the hump of, we're doing well enough now, we don't need well, that? Well, okay. in the case in which people are choosing voluntarily what system of contract we to be dealing with each other in, um, a lot of voluntary choice, to a large extent, uh, you can just compete by, by making things better. Computer, if, 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 for example, the Amex system was embedded in current law, we're saying, but in signing on to Amex and becoming a, a participant in Amex, you were signing a contract that was itself binding that set things up so that Amex could be a framework whose contracts were in turn more binding than they would have been if they, if they had just been um, you know, out there naked and embedded in current law. Hi, Greg Birch. Uh, first, really, I just have a couple of comments, uh, not necessarily questions. First, I saw nothing inconsistent between the ideas that you expressed and a, and a system of polycentric law and a, a non-state-based law system. So I wanted to say that. A couple of things. One, uh, I was struck by your description of the contracting process in your virtual world as handing over a bundle of rights. One, it sounds like something I've read in Snow Crash. Uh, two, uh, from my study of legal systems, all primitive legal systems develop eventually something that amounts to contract, and they almost always do it uh, in terms of some formalistic act in the world, not first as a, as a legal framework of an expression of a bundle of rights. Roman law had forma physical formalities up until recent times. We had, uh, we had seals and whatnot, and there was a reification of the contract, much like your handing over of the wallet that was in the primitive legal mind seen as the act of contracting itself. What happened, of course, is because the enforcement mechanism was separate from the contract, that had to be abstracted into concepts such as meeting of minds, intent, 
execution, etc. So what I find real interesting is that there's a possibility of almost a return to the most primitive concept of contract here. We don't need to be concerned with the details of execution. So I think that's real interesting to see what will happen with that. Uh, finally, uh, and I'm sure you're aware of this, there's an example in history very similar to what the process you're talking about of a new legal regime developing out of the fact that a, a something like your computer system will replace, evade, or ignore an existing legal regime. And that was the development of commercial law and admiralty law in the age of exploration in the Renaissance. What happened there was you had people doing new things in a new environment that was physically beyond the reach of the existing legal system and conceptually beyond the reach of the existing legal system, which was static property-based and status-based, as you said, with the, with the, uh, in the Middle Ages. The, that legal system that developed the Lex Mercatoria and the Admiralty Law system, though, has been reabsorbed in a sense. Those legal systems, it was a completely separate legal system, different courts, different concepts, different people did it in different ways. In this century, though, eventually, finally, Admiralty and the commercial law were recombined with that original feudal-based legal system. And I'm wondering whether you thought about what happens down the road when that law that, have, that has to still deal with the physical reality of that, that, that part comes to terms with and bumps up against the legal regime that you imagine. Will uh, it reabsorb? Will it continue to be a separate regime? Do they exist side by side? Can one, can one contain the other? I guess is my question. Uh, I think you're asking very good questions. And uh, I think that, that, that they don't have short answers, but I can certainly tell that I would very much like to talk to you more about that. Okay. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe you and I and Nick can get together because I see that there's a lot of fertile ground there. Because, because this concept of levels and emulation, I think, eventually in a historical context, might come to a remarriage down the road. So something to think about. Thank you. Yeah, I have to finish with Robert. Okay. Um, I, I like the thinking in terms of the thresholding of privacy, but I want to focus a little more on that finite range and see where it really lies. Uh, in you know, to totalitarian regimes, you have the concept of you know, your friends ratting on you, people down the hall ratting on you, that sort of thing. Uh, if you're in this insulated room by yourself talking to the computer, or your computer's talking to something, maybe you've got copyright, maybe you have free speech. Uh, if you watch TV with friends, if you like to tell other people about your web pages, which side of the line are you on? Um, I think that's, um, yeah, it's the, the, the threshold isn't quite as sharp as I was drawing it there. It's not, it's not a complete step function. Um, there is that gray right there in the middle between full, fully private and fully public. And what that gray is, is that um, if I tell you something and I ask you not to tell somebody else, you can still tell somebody else, the information can still become public, uh, I can't stop you. I might not even find out about it until it's way too late. I might not even find out who leaked. But if you're my friend, you may choose not to reveal the information further. So the fact that those choices are, you know, are certainly both possible and will happen means that information can be shared without becoming public. It's just that once you, the farther it spreads, the more people, the, the more vulnerable it is to simply becoming public. Uh, does that answer the essence of your question? Um, just, just for, for thought's sake, imagine uh, people really want to keep copyright, so they uh, have an uh, execution uh, okay. penalty for, for anybody who's co doing copyright and a million dollar uh, bounty for anybody catching anybody with this copyright. Could we okay. keep copyright? Okay, yes, I, I'm sorry, that's, I, think, I, I think of that as a very different kind of gray in my, right there in the middle than that one. Um, yeah, I think that by, as you're saying, by increasing the penalties tremendously, that current law can hold on to enforcement for a good long time by such increase of penalties, but it does so at a much greater cost to itself. The plausibility that law would hold on at those costs reduces as you push it. Um, so the impossibility for some things is overstated. It's simply that impracticality and the law giving up and becoming a non-issue is sufficient. Okay, thank you very much, Mark.
note actually that I was mentioning the interview, which I believe they previously conducted back in actually numbers 10 and 11, which are out there. Uh, I was actually, it was earlier, earlier sort of thinking on the same kind of topic, about talking about automated defense systems and enforcement of, of, of rules. Um, I think it might not be very interesting. There's some discussion of the, uh, the daily incident still where you had uh, some kind of uh, interplanetary policing system. It's a very interesting interview.